You're listening to 99.1 WQRTLP, and welcome to Radio Free Book Club for February 2024. I'm Ken Honeywell. I'm a writer and reader from Indianapolis, and this month we're discussing a bit of near-future science fiction. It's Nana Kwame Ajebrenya's Chain Gang All-Stars. It was one of the most lauded books of 2023, named one of the New York Times' as five best novels of the year, shortlisted for the National Book Award. It was Ajebrenya's first novel, follow-up to his 2018, excuse me, 2018 collection of short stories called Friday Black. In fact, Chain Gang All-Star started out as a short story intended for that mostly dystopian collection, but grew to novel length because, according to the author, he wanted to spend more time developing the book's main character, the convicted murderer and hard action sports star Loretta Blood Mama Thurwar. So thank goodness we have a talented bunch of hard action readers here with us today. I'd love for them to introduce themselves. Hello there, Christine. Hello, Ken. Happy New Year. It's past the New Year, but first yeah. book club of the New Year. Yeah, nice to see you. Yeah. Um, and hello, everyone listening. I'm Christine Hudson. I uh, live and work in Indianapolis. I work in marketing. Um, and this year, I've been doing a lot more reading <clears throat> a lot more reading than usual. So super happy to be here to talk about this book. And just excited for another fun book club discussion. Yeah, I'm not sure how you could read a lot more. You read a lot anyway, so. I didn't read much last year. Yeah. I realized because I was spending too much time on my phone. So All right. So it's to switch this year. All right. I yeah, but were you good... reading on your phone? No, TikTok. Oh, okay. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, hello. Seated next to Christine. Hello, Craig. Hi. I'm Craig Von Dalen. I'm a father, architect, um, landlord and go-to science fiction pontificator on the uh, the book club here. All right. Yeah, you really are. I'm the science fiction. Evidently, I get all the science fiction books. Yeah. Well, lucky you, I would say. Yeah, it's not bad. Yeah. Christine gets a lot of them, too. I know mm-hmm. Christine's a good science fiction reader, and I know Corey's a science fiction reader I am, as well. Yeah. Hello, Hello. A new book club member. Yeah, I'm the noob. Yay. Uh, so I'm Corey Dalton, and I am a reader and a writer who lives in Indianapolis. Don't write as much as I should, although my day job is a medical writer, so I do have writing in my title. Um, as far as other things that I do. Uh, I have an MFA from Butler in creative writing, went there and edited fiction for their little journal. And I was associate editor for the Saturday Evening Post for a few years. And now I am trying to finish a novel, but it's getting on my nerves. Yeah. 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 So. Did you, you never met Norman Rockwell, did you? Oh, we were besties. Were you? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, but the weird thing is they do have like a lot of original Norman Rockwell art yeah. there in the building. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So... I'm just saying, I don't know how the security is, but those are worth a lot. They yeah, need right. Some money. Yeah, I, um, I've been in meetings there, and I used to have a friend who worked at Trap and Field. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, which is the trap shooting, the Bible of the trap of shooting it industry. Is. Everybody knows <laughs> Trap and Field. <laughs> right. Not um, me, but that's okay. <laughs> well, we'll thanks, Corey. Yeah. <laughs> Great to have you. And just before we jump in, I want to remind listeners that Radio Free Book Club is, in fact, a book club and not a review show. We will be spoiling chain gang all-stars early and often. So if it's on your reading list, you're the type of reader who likes to keep the suspense until the end of the book. And I'd say the outcome of this story is definitely in question right up until the last sentence. In fact, we we're, we're may, may have a debate about whether we want to mention what the ending of this book is. Um, in any case, if you're going to read it, you might want to uh, sit this out and come back and listen another time, which is easy to do because you can find this and all the episodes of Radio Free Book Club on Mixcloud, on WQRT.org, and on Spotify, Apple, Amazon, just about anywhere you stream podcasts. Instead, consider giving a listen to some of WQRT's other great programming like Musical Family Trees, Local Music Hour, spotlighting musicians and musical events across Indiana. And please do come back later for our discussion of Chain Gang All-Stars, which we will get to right now. Okay, that's fair warning. Let's start the discussion. Who would like to? Christine, you're a pretty reliable, uh, give us a give us a setup about the book here. Sure. Okay. So <clears throat> in this book, which I interestingly, <clears throat> excuse me, I didn't, it feel like this was science fiction. It felt more like a 
I don't know what it felt like, but I probably wouldn't have described it as science fiction, but I, I do feel like sci-fi is the closest. Um, so in this book, we're introduced to essentially one of our main characters, Loretta Thurar, who Ken has mentioned, um, and she's in this sort of gladiator style battle. Um, and we come to learn that she's battling for her freedom. We come to learn about CAPE, which is a program that takes inmates with a life sentence or a murder sentence. I think it's 25 years or uh, the death penalty. And they have the option to sign up for this program where they essentially fight to the death and then the winner or if you achieve a high enough rank then you earn your freedom back and then it also follows people who are, people who work for cape in some level or another all the way from a board of director level to the person who drives the van um, and then probably most importantly it follows the spectators and protesters of cape so people who are really into hard action sports which is um, sort of how the fans of cape are described they also call it entertainment lynching which I found to be a lot more accurate than hard action sports <laughs> um, and then it also follows the protesters some of whom are related to inmates who had previously been in the cape system before they were low freed or killed um, so throughout this book we're mostly following Loretta <clears throat> and her sort of equally this is a long summary i'm sorry but we're following no, no. <laughs> keep going you're doing great <laughs> we're following uh, loretta as well as her partner lover and battle star champion um <clears throat> Uh, Stacks, what's her first name? Hurricane? Hammera Hurricane, Hammer, Hurricane. Oh, Hammer, Stacker. Right. Yeah. Uh, Hammera Stacker, who they call Stacks. It's Stacks, six, 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 six. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Stacks with like four <laughs> Triple X's. Right. Uh, she's a real baddie. But, <laughs> but anyway, so we sort of follow her. And then I also uh, really appreciated the way that other character stories are woven in. So we also meet inmates in a flashback, in a series of flashbacks who are not yet involved in CAPE. And we get to see how they come to be involved in this horrific program. So if you're wondering why would anyone sign up for this, you get to see exactly why these inmates would opt into this yeah. program. Largely, it's a critique on America's absolutely horrific incarceration problem. Um, I feel like that covers just about all of it. Yeah, it's graphic that's... and gritty and hard. and Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, very good. All right, end of episode. Yeah, <laughs> yep. there it is. Great. <laughs> <laughs> You've been listening to book summaries by Christine Hudson. Um, yeah, uh, Corey, what do you? What What were your general impressions? What well, you? I like the point that you made that it almost didn't feel like science fiction. It was almost like an alternate reality, just a hair's breadth away from where we actually <laughs> are. Um, and I'll just add that I do think it was a critique of the, um, you know, the prison industrial complex and the for-profit prison industry. And that was proven by the sort of footnotes that were interwoven throughout the book. But to me, it it missed the mark on criticizing that and focused more on uh, Americans' appetite for violence and othering people and creating... Um, like violent sports and reality TV and setting people up just so you can then knock them down and, and, and almost turning people into a commodity. And so for me, it read more of a critique of like reality television and sports uh, and, and, and all that is there as well. But because the, the people in the book who were ostensibly prisoners were so divorced from what our current prison system is, and they were allowed to travel in groups and have these behind the scenes parts and, um, it, it for me, didn't feel like it was talking about our current prison system, but it, it is believable that it's someplace it could go. So, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, there it, certainly there are all those elements in the book. Yeah. I mean, it was certainly not just a critique of the prison system, but also of yeah. all of those <clears throat> things. Yeah. Craig, what do you think? What were your first impressions? Um, it was the most frighteningly important book that I've read in a long time. It was really frightening in that it described what could happen with the pervasive influence of social media, also the ability for cameras to go and be anywhere, um, and then the potential evolution of what could happen in a privatized criminal justice system. Um, it was really scary, um, and I could see it potentially happening, which is even more frightening. Um, the, the character development description by, by the author was amazing. His introduction of Stax to us <laughs> was that, that just that, that introduction of her entering the arena and the oh, description it was, majestic. Of her was like, wow, unbelievable. Right. I mean, I, 
I can't imagine it not being optioned for some kind of film, but unfortunately that would just continue to permeate this concept, which I'm afraid somebody's going to take up and we're going to actually see this become reality, which would be disturbing. Mm -hmm. Well, so. that's very, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, but that's a really interesting point, Craig, though, you know, what would, I mean, it's a thrilling story as well. And the descriptions are thrilling. But you know? then, as it's being thrilling, I just found myself feeling bad. Oh, because, of yeah, I was like, this is exactly what it's critiquing. Like, I would read the parts where right. they were being gentle to each other and, yeah. you know, love scenes and talky <clears throat> parts. And then I was like, when's the next fight coming? Yeah. And then I was like, wait a minute, I'm yeah, one of those people. In. I'm, yeah. Yeah. Like, <laughs> right? I'm the people in the audience. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Like you said, our appetite for violence. I yeah. feel like I have a very low appetite for violence. And so. I was, by the end, skipping over any graphic depictions of violence because I was like, I can't take another paragraph of, like, someone's absolutely gruesome end on the battleground. But what's, yeah. oh, sorry, oh, but no, what's funny ahead. is that that was also covered in the book by the couple that was, yeah. you know, enjoying the games. And the guy was really into the violence, and, and the but the hook for his girlfriend was the storyline, mm -hmm. like the behind people. this, yeah, yeah, the people part. Right. And so it's it's almost like that, you know, you were hooked by the same part she was hooked mm -hmm. on. But either way, you're both hooked. You're hooked, well, yeah, and you're but, feeding into it. And then, yeah. but, but by the time she was hooked on the story, she then... Had, eventually endorsed the violence as well. Had yeah. yeah. Well, because that was the culmination slowly. of the story. Yeah. yeah, it was like, who's going to die, you know? That's how seductive this stuff is. Yeah. Yeah. The other interesting character development was, uh, um, what's a scorpion? Um, Scorpion Singer oh, Hendrix. Yeah. Singer. Right. And because that, that was all started at the very beginning of the book where, where they were just gradually introducing it to him mm -hmm. through some, in a very poetic way, mm -hmm. the way it was written. Um, by the way, I, I also listened to this book on audio. I read it and listened to it on audio. The audio book is amazing. You might want to just pick it up and listen to it, just a mm -hmm. piece of it because they had four different actors doing the reading oh. and they did different voices for different characters. And it was really fascinating because even and that sort of gave you some insight into the particular characters. Yeah. Um, well, let's get into a few specific things. So the first thing that happens in the book, basically, is the reigning champion of Chain Gang All-Stars, Melancholia, is, you know, in the ring with this nobody. You know, her first fight, right? There's no way she can survive it. She's like the guy she's she's like later when Loretta is facing mm -hmm. off against the kid. Right. Yeah. The kid yeah, had she no had a chance. literal corkscrew yeah. as a weapon. Right. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. Well, I forget what the kid had, like a bucket. He, or I think something. he had a pan. Oh, uh, yeah. He yeah. had a pan. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. pan. That's right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And there was one person that got assigned a spoon at mm -hmm. one point. Right. Yeah. 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 Right. So the starters. Yeah. Right. Going up so, against, for people who haven't read it, a hammer and yeah. like a, an right. axe. Or a scythe. Yeah. Right. A scythe. Right. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah. 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 Omaha. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> for a while, yeah. I thought that was a character. <laughs> I was yeah. like, wait. Well, kind of was. Yeah, it really was. Yeah. 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 So, right. So a, a, a newbie with a corkscrew is up against a goddess with a hammer and a scythe. Why did Melancholia decide to lose? I think it was a very similar reason to why, um, um, what's his, the, uh, the, uh, Sunset. Sun, Sunset. Sunset. Yeah. Harkless? Yeah. decided he didn't want to live in either is because how could you go on and because she was going to if she had won that bout, she would have been free, high freed. Right. How could you go on and live a life after what you'd done? I mean, they had like killed numerous individual humans in an acceptable way and then were cheered for doing mm -hmm. so. I cheered for doing what they got put away for. Yeah, and, exactly. yeah, in the first place, it was just, you know, I can't imagine the psychology of going from that environment and then being a free human being. Um, it, it, it would almost be un, uh, untenable. You couldn't even, I, I can imagine they can't even, they, she couldn't even imagine doing that. Yeah. I mean, even inmates who are, are, um, released from regular prison systems still just can't cope with society. The rates of recidivism are crazy because it's like you've been locked away for this long and suddenly it's like, okay, you're done. Go back. Right. And in the case of Melancholia Bishop, like why on earth would she want to go back into, into the society that is like rabid for this type of entertainment? 
Like, what what is her life? Gonna, what's her, what's yeah. her quality of life going to be like? Does she want to be a part of this society? Yeah. Right. I think there were like three instances in the book where somebody could have been or is going to be high freed, right? And the first two, they, they chose death, even mm-hmm. though they had the option to escape. And in the last instance, it appears that person is choosing life. But I think the difference is because of what was going on outside of the ring in society that these protests had started and somebody jumped into the ring with a sign supporting this. So it's like the first two didn't think they had anything to live for after they would get out. Right. And the third one realizes that there's now this pushback against these gladiatorial games. So she's going to go join up with them and try to make things better. And the only... Grand Colossal, who had been freed, was supposedly an industry plant, right? Yeah, it was like, like a fixed, to make, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. To make it seem to like make they it could seem possibly, it like it possibly get right. to that point. Right, yeah. what was his he name? Nova Kane. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's right. But the yeah. fans totally saw Nova through Kane that, Walker. remember? And they yeah. were like, oh, that's that guy's so lame. Nothing gets yeah. by those hard no, action those sports hard fans. Action. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's right. and that's, you know, I forget how many seasons they had a year, but was it three seasons a year or something? And this was the 33rd season, so, Well, the 33rd season was game ready to start. Right. It yeah. appeared that there was like a week between seasons. So mm-hmm. yeah, right. it was yeah. kind of just never ending. So like that means though that like in 10 years, yeah. one person yeah. had ever gotten to the end. Right. Yeah. And certainly there had to have been more people that close to High Freed. Yeah. But I mean, they don't, the fans, these hard actions, they don't actually want to see people High Freed. That's not the point, right? right like they're right. here for the blood sport and the entertainment <laughs> lynching. Uh-huh. And they want to see somebody die. Exactly. Is... They would love to see a Grand Colossal die. Yeah. Although I did wonder that it did seem like the fans really, you know, started empathizing with these people and caring about them in in the way that you would care about a celebrity or someone in a movie. Like it was very surface level. But in the last near the end, they decide they're going to change the rules, right, to a way that is going to cause two of the fan favorites to you have to kill each other. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I'm not sure I understood the reasoning behind that from the people running the games and that, because to me that seemed like they already had these protesters. And if you're going to change things to then tick off the fans as well, I wasn't sure what the reasoning there was. I don't know. Do you think it ticked off the fans or just titillated the fans? If you're I a mean, hardcore fan, maybe the same thing, you know, don't you want to see, I mean, if you're, is Anybody in this room an MMA fan? No. Has anyone ever watched it? Oh. No. No, but I, I was going to draw the, the parallel to him. Yeah. But can, go ahead. Yeah. No, I mean, I just, I, I don't, I can't uh, speak to it authoritatively either. I'm not a fan. I did used to watch boxing when mm-hmm. I was a kid and to see two guys you know, be able to pummel each other over a series of rounds, man, that was thrilling. Yeah. yeah. And wasn't. I think they want, you want to see the two best face off. Yeah. Right. See. Someone's yeah. the champion, right? But yeah. remember the flip side to the, the way they were getting people addicted, it was the fighting and then there was the reality TV mm-hmm. aspect. Right. And yeah. so I would think the reality TV aspect people though, who have bought into this love story between these two characters and really, you know, had grown to have affection for them. They seem like the ones that would be, Against the twist, but yeah. who knows? Like you said, maybe yeah. maybe ticking people off is the same as titillating them. It's, it's it's another reason to watch. Like, oh, I'm so mad. I got to watch and see what happens. Well, you know, it's a tragedy, though. It, however you slice it, yeah. right? Almost all those people. You've got to figure. Even if you're a fan, I mean, you've got to figure that almost every one of those people is going to be dead. That's what's mm-hmm. happened over the course of ten years. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, and I don't it's know. Like, once that one dies, a hard action sports fans will be upset for what, maybe five or six days, and then here comes the next one. Yeah. So it's an endless stream of like they become attached to this one figure, that figure dies, they're upset for a short while, and they find someone else. They find yeah. an up and coming someone who's moving through the ranks quickly, and that's the new person. Right. And it just never ends. How could you not have been a fan of Unkillable, <laughs> Simon. unkillable jungle. Yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> Simon Craft, <laughs> right. jungle craft. Right. His well, narration was my favorite. I think. The, yeah. The, uh, going back, I think the the reason for the whole death bout between Stax and uh, um, Thurwar was more of a business decision. 
because Thurwar never really, she did what Melancholia told her to do. She didn't play their game. She didn't adapt. She didn't adopt some moniker. She didn't, uh, she, she survived certainly. And she fought, but she didn't, uh, she didn't play into the narrative that they wanted her to play into. And I think they wanted her dead. And I think they figured the best way to kill her was to put her up against the woman in the world that she loved the most, who was also a stone cold killer as well. And they've just figured she would capitulate and allow Stex. And I'm going to keep saying that just because I like that. <laughs> but that, that, I think they just wanted, they figured that that would be what would happen and it would solve a problem because they didn't really want her high freed because she was going to be a problem high freed for them. And I think that's where this book is going to head or the next. That's, book I was going to say like head. the ending, you know, do we think this was a happy ending? <laughs> no, no, I don't either. I don't think there's going to be no, any, change. there was no happy ending chance. Like no. as I was reading this, I was like, I'm not going to become attached to any of these characters. <laughs> How'd that work I out know, for you? I, it worked out well. I put up some kind of mental wall yeah. where I just like convinced myself I didn't like any of them. Yeah. Um, well, let's yeah, talk I about know. I did. I did. So cool. But I just like I needed her. some head space. <laughs> well, I have to protect my it. own head space. I get it. <laughs> Let's talk about that, though, Christine. Who who did you find yourself attracted to? What characters did were doing it for you? So I was actually really interested in those two minor characters that we met along the way, Hendrix Young and Simon J. Craft, especially mm-hmm. Simon and his time in solitary confinement. Right. He was the one in solitary, right? Yeah. He was in solitary, but he with also the, uh, had been influenced about a million yeah, times. Yeah. Yes. So just torture out and out. I right. mean, solitary confinement in and of itself is torture, and then you have the influencer. Um, I was really interested in his story i also liked how each and that's interesting you say that craig about the audiobook because each sort of uh character narration especially simon and hendrix young had such a distinct voice that i like found myself reading it differently in my head mm-hmm. so i was really i liked simon and hendrix young or young Hend- hendrix hendrix young. yeah hendrix yeah, yeah. young singer. Um, scorpion singer yeah. and scorpion singer i liked both of them i thought their stories were really interesting and i tend to like short stories and i feel like each of their chapters sort of read like their own short story mm-hmm. um and of course i liked Stax and and Thurwar as well um but i also sort of found myself wanting to i didn't want to like them i wanted to keep distance because i was afraid of getting hurt <laughs> you're so like one of like, the gladiators in the games here me yeah by trying to keep yourself emotionally distant from the I other guess. people I you know? know i'm so soft though <laughs> no but what i mean is like you know if you yeah. were in that situation that's what mm-hmm. you would be doing too yeah. like I, just, I don't want to like these people like yeah like what's the point because you know they're all gonna die it's gonna be yeah. tragedy and heartbreak yeah um I will say I was just sort of wholly uninterested in other links in the chains. I just, I couldn't keep up yeah. with them. I don't feel like they were. There were a lot of them. There's a lot yes. of them. And again, you know, they're all going to die. So it's like, right. how long is it going to be four pages or 40? Yeah. I, either way, they're dead. <laughs> yeah. I was glad when they, they introduced the one that Scorpion and the guy that had been tortured were in. And. And uh, like three of them were just like triplicates. And then I was right. like, OK, good. Oh, yeah, well, then yeah. I don't have to remember <laughs> right. you know, exactly. who they are. Whatever. Right. But yeah. that was one thing you, you mentioned that it read like short stories. Like to me, I really, really liked this book, but I, it felt like it meandered in parts and it felt like it got repetitive in parts. Yeah. And it read to me like a really good long short story that had had a bunch of other stuff inserted into it. And you said earlier, Ken, that it did start as a short story. I yeah, didn't even know that. By the way, has anyone ever read uh, Friday Black? No. No, boy, I didn't read it. Boy, the, there are some great stories in that. Okay. I'll yeah. have to give that a... Yeah, because yeah. it reminded me of like George Saunders a little bit. Well, he but, studied under George Saunders. Well, oh, that would make sense. There you so, go. <laughs> yeah. But it read like a, sh- like a George Saunders short story that had become too long and then had a bunch of other things stuck into it. And, and the other things varied in how interested I was in them. And so there were parts where it was a little bit of a chore to get through certain chapters. But it was nice because then it was like, okay, well, this is just a short story that I didn't love this short story. Let's move on to the next one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Craig, what characters did you you care for? I liked Singer Hendrix. The mm-hmm. whole his whole story of where he came from and working in the butcher shop yeah. of the mm-hmm. prison and everything, I wanted him to. I, I'm. It's unfortunate that he got paired with Jungle Craft mm-hmm. because <laughs> that guy obviously was very very psychotic. But he, right, but he was Jungle Craft's. Yeah, like, he was his controller, mind, his, yeah. controller yeah. his muse, or what? I don't. I don't know. But yeah. it was. Yeah, I kind of liked that guy. Yeah. I and mean, you, you knew that was not going to end well. No, you yeah, knew those guys were going true. down. Yeah. yeah, but it just represented like the the 
the the the what the prison system does to these people it just mm-hmm. puts them in a place where they would be willing to do something like that or the things they're willing to do just to get out of it and the influencer was also very frightening cool. so oh, yeah so on that note and and I just want to uh, break in for a second and say we're talking about um, Nana Kwame Aji Brenya's chain gang all stars um, Craig what did you think about the footnotes that actually tied the story into present day or even past events, real life events. I'm a big fan of the footnote. I liked it. I mean, it it just made everything. It it told you where the author was coming from, what he was thinking about, what the reasoning was, how we ended up potentially or could end up here. Um, I I had no problem with the footnotes at all. Um, And they were read that way in the audio book, too, which was very interesting. Um, It it just shined a bright light on the things that are happening with privatization of the of the criminal justice system in the United States of America, which could eventually lead to something like this. Uh-huh. I mean, can you imagine if Vic, Vince McMahon ran like a private prison company? We would definitely have this type of situation. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's par- another reason I <clears throat> had trouble imagining this as sci-fi was because it feels way too close to reality. I yeah. like my sci-fi to exist in another realm of existence. <laughs> yeah. And this felt like we're 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 right there we're we're on the yard goal line to use a sports i don't know sports analogy yard line. what a, is it there's called? some sports game coming up where they do that I think. <laughs> oh, yes uh, that's the one yeah. yeah i think i actually thought when we were first introduced out of the blue to the to the guy that was being tortured in solitary confinement i actually thought those were going to be chapters that were from today's actual prison system mm, and i yeah. thought that there was going to be a parallel narrative and then at the end we were going to find out that like oh you thought everything you were reading was this sci-fi thing it's not these chapters are actually like this person's story and so then once they introduced more sci-fi stuff about the influencer and stuff i was like oh, okay well this this isn't yeah. real yeah. but it, that to your point it did feel very real yeah. and i thought okay this is actually i think from today and that's really i think that's a reasonable conclusion to draw especially because the footnotes are like that so yeah. some of the footnotes are facts about the prison system or the history of the prison system and some of them are additional details about fictional right. characters hmm. which i thought worked really well well and i would also say for me anyway the footnotes reinforce the believability kind of as craig said maybe not that we're on our way here but the believability of of the things that happen in the story like so many suicides yeah. like how yeah. maybe solitary confinement is actually torture right yeah um yeah so Corey, who's which character was the scariest and which one came to the saddest end or who is the saddest? Who is the saddest? And I think who the, scariest the scariest and the saddest is the same. It was, uh, and I keep forgetting his name, but the guy that was tortured to the point where he did Simon J. Craft. Yeah, Simon, Simon J. Craft. How can I forget his name? He repeated Just it every of, other yeah. line. Jungle Craft. Yeah, <laughs> Jungle Craft. I mean, I thought that was the saddest. And, and you know, you you try to, I don't know, you're, you're playing the game that the book gives you too, where you're like, well, this guy's a murderer and a rapist. I shouldn't feel bad for him. But no, it's there's still a human being there. And he was tortured to the point of all he knew was his name mm-hmm. and to obey and to try to avoid more pain. And that was just pathetic and sad. But then when he was released and immediately murdered that entire chain gang, except for our scorpion friend, uh, who, who thankfully discovered at the last second, you just had to say, stop doing that. Um, so, yeah, I thought he was the saddest, most pathetic and scariest character all rolled into one. Yeah. 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 Agree. Anybody agree? Mm-hmm. Yeah. There was that guy with the frying pan, though. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was just a moment of sadness. <laughs> or the, the, the gentleman with the golf yeah. club who then ended up getting a, a samurai. So a oh, Rico. Yeah, Rico. Rico. Yeah. yeah. Got a badass sword. The guy with the, uh, the frying pan was, um, he was named Peanut. <laughs> Or no, it was teacup. Teacup, teacup. Yeah. Yes. by um, yeah. by Mickey Wright. Mickey Wright oh. seems like came up with all the nicknames. I would, mm-hmm. right? If I'm being honest, Mickey Wright was horrifying to me. Yeah. I actually thought the spectators were the scariest part. But Will was he the spectator? That was yeah. Will. Let's yeah. talk about that. Will and Emily. I, oh, I hated Will. I absolutely hated <laughs> Will. I actually thought he was one of the most terrifying because he is so close to reality. Yeah, like, I know we that all guy. Know, so yeah. We all know Will yeah. and the way he was like mansplaining the way that sports work to Emily. And he forced her to watch it. And he was like, this has brought us closer. 
I thought he was disgusting. But she was terrifying as well how she played the game, too. I like, didn't like her either. Yeah, because yeah. she was like, I'll be quiet and let him tell me because I know it, it makes insane. him feel like a yeah. powerful man. Yeah. And like, ugh. Yeah. yeah, they were awful. They were terrible. And I like, I <laughs> eventually I started skipping over their chapters, too. I think it was like, I don't know. I just couldn't, I couldn't read another sentence about Emily and Will. Yeah. Um, but I thought Mickey Wright was terrifying. I also was absolutely horrified by the board of directors as well. Yeah. yeah. Especially, and I'm not sure if this guy was on the board, but especially the guy that saw the doctor's technology for rewiring your nervous system and nerves. Mm -hmm. And the guy that said, let's make this into an instrument of torture. Right. He was like, made my skin crawl. You gotta was be he like, on the board? That's or a no? Mengele yes. kind of right? He was like, one of the. He was one of the villain. kids of the one yeah. of the founders. Because he or was something. dating. Yeah, I think it was Lucas mm -hmm, w right. West Splat or something. Mm -hmm. yeah. I I couldn't like I just yeah like as, aside from of course the characters who are painted at, or the characters who <clears throat> you immediately think are scary. Like, okay, I get that they're scary for a reason or they're scary because they're in this horrible cape program where they have to kill to stay alive. And then there's the people not in the program who are just the worst humans. Uh -huh. They're the ones that scared me the most. Yeah. And they walk among us. <laughs> they do. <laughs> yeah, probably. Terrible. <laughs> right. Yeah. It's terrible. They're voting. Yeah. They're getting elected. I just, oh, oh my God. I know. I, I, yeah. Sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> this yeah. is what my it's brain the world was we thinking live in. The, the, announcer, the announcer, though, at the end of the book started to hate himself, too. I right. bet he, he did. He was yeah. getting to a point where he's like, I did he wasn't happy. Yeah. I mean, no. how much yeah. of that can you take? But was he not happy because he thought the fans were going to turn on them? No, he was not no. happy because he, he was he, disgusted. He was disgusted yeah. by the whole thing. But just like the other announcer that went on air and she just totally. So I wonder what him. led him to, to that character change then. Because earlier in the book, he seemed really into it and he was really offended that uh, Loretta would not p take any of his nicknames yeah, that he came yeah. with. It appears stuff, as so. though what led him to that was them pitting Stax yes. and Loretta. Oh, and that's what I was saying is like, I felt like that was a bad decision on the part of the managers that they were going to get. You know, people were going to turn on it. Maybe that's supposed to be the happy ending is that maybe they made a misstep and everybody's going to be pissed off. And now she's going to go in the real world and lead a revolt. I mean, they can just undo it, though. Like, they can. I know. Yeah. It's not going to work. But it, I, I like the, the <laughs> I'm the trying to optimism. be helpful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What you all think of the, um, the, the farmer's market scene? Oh, loved it. Yeah, <laughs> that was the best was part of the book, I thought. <laughs> and honestly, why was because as I was reading, like I said, it kept reminding me, reminding me of George Saunders, uh, some of his short stories. But I missed there wasn't as and, and this is a very dark topic. So it makes sense. There's not a ton of humor in it. But, you know, there were attempts at humor with the branding on people and making it ironic right, or right. some of the nicknames and, and, and the host that we all hated. But for me, that scene worked because it was so it was so dark and yet so ridiculous where they're, you know, forcing these gladiators to like serve ice cream to children. And then it devolves into this melee and, you yeah. know, you've got the cotton candy machine. And so that was my favorite part of the book, actually. Interesting. Well, that yeah. and the kid, the son of the Jumped ice cream the people jumping yeah. into the we're crowd and becoming I don't part support of the protest. Pick it's it's like, like, wow. yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> right. Christine, what'd you think of that scene? It was interesting and unexpected. At the time, I was just kind of like, why is this in here? Um, I think like, Corey, I didn't like, I didn't appreciate the, I was like too horrified. I was like on edge the whole time I was reading this book, like yeah. waiting for a bomb to go off. So I was scared to enjoy anything. Um, but now that you describe it <clears throat> in that way, like, yeah, it's ridiculous. It was and so it was, ridiculous. That was after their big march and after the melee and that yeah. the inmate or the, the Cape program participant who had died by suicide. And then suddenly they're being <laughs> dropped off at a farm. <laughs> Farmer's market. market. <laughs> and the people were like, let me show you these tomatoes. And it was like a, the people in the market had like a special permission, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They had had to negotiate to get, because yeah. it was going to be a boost to It was like the people who yeah. eat on the big events on Top Chef. Yeah. Oh, you know, it's yeah. like the people who get into the, because they're on TV, right? I mean, mm -hmm. now they're on a yeah. TV show. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. a funny analogy. Yeah, it was weird. Um, but I guess that probably felt like the sort of peak or like culmination of the critique of reality TV yeah. was like, OK, <laughs> here it is. And here's how it went. It's reality TV. And the kid jumped the fence. Was it literally a fence or am I imagining? No, no it was a fence. So they yeah. had a barricade. <laughs> yeah. yeah, like a six foot barricade. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, Craig, speaking of Mickey Wright, he, at the end of the book, says, you know, maybe maybe there's some hope. Do you where did he get that hope from? 
I don't know. Maybe the God. I don't want to do the spoiler thing, though. I know the, you don't. But the surviving it it. in the surviving individual at the end of the book <laughs> would potentially become a very serious problem for the uh, for the the company because she was not going to be an advocate. And uh, where where Novocaine was an advocate, and I believe even did color periodically for some of the fights, she was not going to be an advocate, and um, um, that could be a big problem for them. Um, and they and if they if she died some for some mysterious reason, that would also be a big problem for them because mm-hmm. the whole point was that you could fight your way to being freed, and if if that high freed thing didn't actually exist for some of these criminals. You're, they're not going to be happy, and yeah. it could get really messy. And how do you justify, without the possibility of high freed, how do you justify the whole CAPE program? Exactly, because they're yeah. signing a contract. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. I mean, they, I, I think it's back to, again, is the ending happy or not? Do we do we think it's a hopeful ending or not? I, I still think that the management and the government holds all the cards, and if they want to mm-hmm. kill her, they'll kill her before yeah. she even gets out. And they'll come up with some reason for it, and the fans will go along because they're addicted to all of this. Like, I, and, and they even say said that a lot of the people that signed up to be in the CAPE program did not believe that there was ever going to be a high freed yeah. thing. It was like to get away They're from torture to die or to die the in best their option. own. Yeah. It's die slowly or die now. Exactly. Death yeah. by cop. So I'm not sure that, cop. you know. Yeah. yeah, exactly. I felt like it was so entrenched. Maybe it's, there's no way it's going to crumble at that yeah. point. And I mean, I also like <clears throat> with the, I mean, if the government didn't kill the high freed people, What's to stop them from being convicted of another crime and entering right back into it, which Uh is, I think, fairly realistic. I I meant to look this up before, but I think the rates of recidivism, people who are get out of prison and who are back within like a year or even a shorter frame of time is like, what, 70, 80. I don't want to misquote it, but it's high. high. And so like, could the same apply to these people? That is, I mean, can you imagine (laughs) fighting through they fight one per week, killing multiple people, dozens yeah. of people, being freed and then being wrongly convicted of or wrongly accused of and then convicted of a crime and you're right back where you started. Or you're put or, on some kind of a parole system where you're yeah. still controlled by yeah. a government You're agent. never free. It's, what is free? No, yeah. it, it, what is that? It reminded me like in the Hunger Games where the people that did survive, afterwards they were still controlled by the government yeah. who would literally pimp them out and yeah. like make them into prostitutes yep. and make money off of them. And it now was you're like, just traumatized. Yeah. And also now your, your life <laughs> yeah. is still crap. Yeah. yeah. Um, Simon J. Kraft would have definitely recidivated. Oh, yeah. Have. He would have been back in 10 days. <laughs> if he'd have, yeah, he told him been no. right back. He would yeah, not have gotten out of the stadium, I don't think. Yeah. Bad Simon. He would have killed a fan on the way out. <laughs> <laughs> and that fan would have deserved it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, honestly. Honestly. Yeah, I mean, this was kind of like a more realistic version of Hunger Games, truthfully. Yeah, I mean, this is like Games. this. Bob's the running man. Happen. Remember the running man? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The running man. Yeah. The sad thing is, is it was it was sort of an indictment on, of professional sports, which I'm not. Mm-hmm. I, I'm a huge sports fan. I'm not a an NFL fan or a WWE fan, but I'm a big like NBA basketball fan. I love that sport. I love watching. It's like watching a wonderful dance. And I don't want it to become an indictment of professional sports because I think there's a tremendous value to some professional sports. Yeah, I mean, I think it's I think it's an indictment of the excesses of all of that stuff, yeah. you know, for commercial gain for a, for a very few people. Let me let me get, let me get all socialist on you here, but um, you know that's that's what all of those things have in common: the prison system, the marketing that we're stamping on the players' backs. You know, the leagues themselves, the facilities that host the leagues. I mean, it's all it's all all connected. We're about to see that overhype thing going on here in Indianapolis in two weeks because of or in a week and a half because of the all star game. Yeah. Yeah. There there is a lot of overhyping that's going on. Yeah, for sure. Um, So. You know, kind of on on that note, and in several places, really mostly to the end of the book, we're kind of told pretty directly that all of this is our fault, that we voted for it. Now, obviously, they're talking about, you know, the, 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 the world depicted in the book, but we're also talking about the carceral system as it is today. What do we... What do we think about that? Is this is this our fault? I'll jump in and say yes. Because, you know, we don't want to be involved in this 
but you're still sucked into Instagram. I still click on something because I'm curious. Um, um, Snoop Dogg likes to post videos of people flipping over their bicycles and hurting themselves or whatever. And I still watch them. So, yeah, I, he does. He's like he does a lot of videos of people like falling and, and so forth. And you watch them and you laugh. And you go, ha, ha, ha. I hope that person didn't get hurt seriously. But you do. I mean, we still fall into it. It's a it's a trap. And that's what social media is, is a trap. It sucks you in. But who's trapping us? I agree that we're being falling, but we're still falling in. We don't have to, we don't have to enter the domain. Mm -hmm. We could just leave it entirely behind, but we still do. So I think it is kind of our fault. Are we just, I mean, let's talk about the carceral system a little bit more though. I mean, is that, I mean, are we responsible for that, for just not caring enough? I think so. I mean, I think it's hidden away, right? So you don't, it's not shoved in your face every day with the horrible atrocities that happen. Uh, And so I think we would pretend, we would rather live our lives not knowing what's going on and just think, oh, those are bad people and they deserve what's happening to them. Um, And and there was a statistic in the book too about the percentage of people who are imprisoned that are not even guilty of a crime. And that's the other thing. Yeah. And I was like, you got to think about that side of it as well. All you have to do is just be accused of a crime and look the wrong way or not have the best legal representation. Yeah. And that's it. That's your life over. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, very much so. Yeah. I think if, if we're not raising a fuss and actively opposing injustices, then yeah, we're part of the problem. We're just going along with it. And, and, you know, also in a more literal sense, voting, you know, voter turnout is so low that it's like if if you're not voting against something, you're voting for it, mm. essentially. Yeah. Well, another place we're guilty is we've allowed our carceral system become to become a catch all for all of our problems, like mental problems in our mm-hmm. society. We basically have taken anybody that does not fit in well with our society and as far as our collective perception is concerned, and we've thrown them all together into our carceral system. Yeah. And it's a big problem and we let it happen because it was easy, because it was less expensive than actually having a mental health system that, that was effective. Um, and then the privatization concept it seemed like it would be less expensive as taxpayers for us to privatize prison systems because then we put it into the world of profit motive or the uh, profit companies who will cut back on expenses and they'll take over. But the problem with turning over government activity to private companies is they don't care about anything but making money. And the government has an obligation to keep us safe and protect us. And one of the ways they protect us is by enforcing code and criminal law and then punishing the people that violate it. And if we turn that over to a private company, it's just going to go haywire because all that company cares about is making money. They don't care about fixing the problems that potentially are yeah, causing the, the more prisoners they get to take care of, the better. They make, they make more money. Yeah. yeah. So that th- we, we unfortunately in this world of privatization of government, government uh, activity, are now realizing that that was not a really a good idea because the government at least can be held accountable for making mistakes in that arena. Right. If you've got a corporation who is treated as a person but doesn't actually have a face or morals, then who are you holding accountable? Yeah. Right. Even if they are uh, declared an entity, you know. Yeah. Yeah. You're you're gonna, you can't put a corporation in jail. No. Or can you? Well, maybe maybe we, we need to vote for that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, let's try it. You can, you yeah. can only find it. You can punitively damage or give them financial damages. Or dissolve, or dissolve them. Yeah, or dissolve which I guess them. is like the... But yeah, but we as a, as a collective create governments to to give us structure for our for our lives and our society and we need to make sure that that stays the way it is where it's elected officials that make these decisions and not turn it over to corporations because they just don't give a damn Mm -hmm. they by nature don't yeah well well, yeah all they give a damn about is returning investment money exactly yeah 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 Yeah. Yeah. it's interesting that um that you know how much um how much interest there is in, you know, just making corporations once again care purely about profit. Yeah. Right. There's no, you know, there's, you know, we're, we're penalizing companies for wanting to do good in the world. 
Yeah. Yeah. We're talking about uh, Chain Gang All-Stars. This is Radio Free Book Club, and we're getting kind of close here to time. But uh, I want to just ask, who did you... We can spoil the ending or not. You guys can vote or whatever. But who did you think would win the final fight? Christine, who was your money on? Um, if you were if you were a betting member of the hard action sports <laughs> yeah, fan public. Uh, I would have put my money on stacks. She was pretty, pretty tough. Yeah. Um, mostly just because I sensed, sensed that <clears throat> Thurwar was coming to understand why Melancholia Bishop had let her win in the first place. Um, I didn't think that Thurwar really wanted to be high freed. So my money was on stacks. Okay. Craig, what'd you think? I, that That's the part of the book that I... I kind of wish was a little different. I don't think that they had to fight each other. I think they could have chosen not to fight. Mm, I think they would have been influenced to do something. Yeah, it really? did say earlier yes. on that yeah. if, if contestants refused to fight each other, they mm -hmm. would be tortured. Yeah, Jeez. Yeah. So. yeah. Uh -huh. It's unfortunate. <laughs> that's sad. That, but yeah, I, I, there were, as much as Stax was amazing and her introduction was unbelievable, there were was like calculating. And it was a, it was not a, it was, it was less of a game and more of a science for her. And I, I, I think that she, she had the advantage in that case. Yeah. Corey, who'd you think was going to win? I, th I thought what was going to happen was going to happen or what happened was what was going to happen. I did. I don't. Can, are we spoiling it? Let's do yeah, it. We yeah. Kind of are. So we like, yeah. It's like I, th hard. I thought that in reality, if they were fighting with their full on that, that Stax would have won, but that she would not be able to kill Thurwald. Hmm. And and Stax was my favorite character. And and part of it was that duality that she had where she was this murderous, like, you know, she was just flying blades, basically. But then she would say, I love you, you know, mm -hmm. before she would kill you. And she, it was like she was doing, she only did what she had to do. And and her, her scythe was almost a metaphor for that because, you know, it's got a curved blade on one side and a flat side on one side. Hmm. And so I, I figured the flat side, she had hit people with the flat side a few times to teach them a lesson or, or to wake them up. And so I assume kind of that's what she would do at the end. Would well, be to, you to read it a lot closer than I did yeah. because I thought that ending was just like masterful. I thought yeah. it was, I mean, it's, I'm glad you saw well, it even coming. Even if you because... think about a scythe, you know, it's not actually a weapon. It is to right. reap uh, food. So it's actually to provide food and provide life to people mm. rather than death. Yeah. And so like n learning that she had the scythe and that she would use the, the blunt end sometimes. Didn't she call it Love Guile, too? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Guile. yeah. Well, that, that's what its name was before she got when it. When she though. inherited yeah. it. Love Guile. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, she was just a fascinating character to me, the, the dichotomy yeah. within her. Yeah, yeah, agree. Christine, would you recommend this book? Um, so that is a complete, it's a long answer. Um, <laughs> Please. I would say yes and no. Um, I... I personally had a really hard time getting through this. I am just so tired of stories of black pain. I'm always mm. so excited to be able to pick up a book with a black female lead where there's not violence and grief and death and sadness, yeah. which happens once a year. Right. Um, so to that end, no, if you are listening to this and you're tired of stories of black pain and you're tired and you just already know about how messy and problematic everything is in the whole world. This is only going to hurt more. It's like putting salt in the wound. Um, however, the writing was absolutely incredible. I think this is one of the most well-written books and stylistically interesting books I've read in a really long time. So the literature and book lover in me does recommend it for that reason. Yeah. Great. Great answer. Craig? Yeah. I, uh, similar thoughts as Christine has. I, it's incredibly well-written and so visually I mean, it's like you you can visualize what what's being written written here so well. It's it's a beautiful book. Um, it's got a it's got a really important good message. I think it's definitely the best one that we've read. I've read for the book club for sure, and I, I'd have to recommend it just because of the writing and the fact that it does have an important message that I think everybody should read. 
Yeah, thanks. Corey, what do you think? Yeah, I would definitely recommend it. Um, I enjoyed reading it. You know, there were some parts where I felt like it was repetitive or it was a little bit of a slog to get through, but overall, I really liked it. And if you want, I will edit a version for you where I'll cut out like two thirds of the stuff and then you'll just have like a nice short story. So, <laughs> oh, I do that for kind you. of you, Corey. <laughs> I'm sure the author would love that. Oh, yeah, I'm sure you'll love hearing me say that. Um, <laughs> He's not going to listen to this. No. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I would recommend it. I, I thought it was great. I, I take your point, Christine. It's probably not for every audience, um, but I think every audience probably doesn't need it also. And mm -hmm. I think there are some audiences that need it. I think, I hope this can be a kind of a wake up call to some people. I, I'm not sure that it will be, but, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a hopeful guy. I'm a glass half full guy always. So... Yeah, I, I think some people can get something out of this. So, yeah, speaking of getting something out of this show, who has a who has a book recommendation? Christine, got, got one? Yeah, I do. Um, I have a couple. Um, I think for people that read this book, if you're interested to learn more, I actually have a documentary recommendation. Ava DuVernay is the 13th yeah. is one of the best documentaries I've ever seen. Um, highly recommend. And then also, I think I've recommended this before, so I'm hesitant to do it again, but I have to. Colson Whitehead's The Nickel Boys. Mm. It's also another really good book. A lot shorter than this, but deals with a lot of the same yeah. issues. I don't know if you have, but that's, you can yeah. always recommend that. You yeah. could recommend you can that every recommend time. Colson White. Yeah. Right. Uh, brilliant book, The Nickel Boys. Hard to read as well, but it's, it's quite a lot shorter. And then sort of an unrelated recommendation, one of my favorite books that I've read this year, which is also a collection of short stories um, by Alexandra Chang. It's called Tomb Sweeping, mostly centered on stories of first generation Asian Americans mostly living in California on the West Coast. Um, really fun stories. Some of them are very, very short. Some are a little bit longer. The styles are all over the place. The characters are all over the place. But I'm loving it. I love short stories. And this is probably one of my favorite collections I've read in a while. Yeah. Wow. Um, that sounds really interesting. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and that's it. Yeah. That's all three of my recommendations. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Christine. <laughs> yeah. Craig? Um, I just read, before I read this, A Fever in the Heartland by Egan, and it's definitely worth reading. It's, uh, it's, it's a historical uh, kind of a nonfiction piece about uh, the KKK and its grip on um, um, Americans in the Midwest and the uh, West during the, er, the 20s. And it's, uh, it's, I think everybody should read it, honestly. It's, just, it's very revealing, and it shows how um, there's this innate racism that can be tapped by politicians and ne'er-do-wells um, that's, that's still there probably today. And it's, it's kind of a frightening book and, and worth a read for sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, interesting. Corey. I don't really have a recommendation. Um, I've been like killing all of my time reading through Christopher Tolkien's History of Middle Earth books about his dad's books, <laughs> and like I would not recommend that unless you like need something to put you to sleep. But it's fascinating if you're a Tolkien nerd. And I guess the way that it would tie back to this book is they both have a lot of footnotes. So, <laughs> ah, interesting. but sounds... I am not recommending it. <laughs> okay, okay. Thank you for the non recommendation. Yeah. It's like twelve volumes. Wow, we yeah. wow. It's a lot. So. You know, I usually have have to try to have a recommendation that is some way related to the book we're discussing, and this time I do not. Although I would definitely recommend Friday Black if you haven't read it. Uh, again, yeah, Christine, it, it might be um, some of it might not be uh, comfortable. Yeah. But uh, wow, we what a really good book! And you can and Corey, you can tell he is a George Saunders. Oh, I loved his writing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and so I'm, I'm really interested to dig into some of his short stories. Yeah, I I thought that as well before I even looked it up. And yeah, yeah he was he studied at Syracuse under okay. George Saunders. Yeah, specifically yeah. went to Syracuse. Syracuse to study under George Saunders. Uh, I would too. Yeah. Right. Who wouldn't? I know. So anyway, um, my recommendation this month is a 1976 novel by Richard Yates called The Easter Parade. I, for some reason, I got on a Richard Yates jag this January, and I think it might have been because I saw the episode of Seinfeld where Jerry and George meet Elaine's father, who was based on Richard Yates. It was literally based because um, Larry David dated Richard Yates's daughter. Whoa. <laughs> wow. I love that episode. Right. And I guess oh, like, so like something like that actually happened to him. 
Wow. That's so scientific. So, right. <laughs> so, you know, he's often thought of, usually thought of as like a writer's writer. He's best known for his first novel, which was Revolutionary Road, which is a pretty great novel. It also was pretty forgotten until it was made into a movie. I forget when, some sometime in the aughts with uh, Leonard DiCaprio. But The Easter Parade is one of his later novels and really one I'd, I'd like to encourage you to find. It's a story of a couple of sisters, Sarah and Emily Grimes, their lives just through the middle of the 20th century. And let's just say life does not turn out great for either of them. And life does not turn out great for most Richard Yates characters. But he wrote with just such clarity and empathy and humor and he was not as widely read in his lifetime as he deserved to be. And that was what made him such a horrible, cranky old man, like on the Seinfeld episode. I think it's <laughs> apparently really true. So, you know, now you have the power to correct this great injustice. Go go find uh, some Richard Yates books. The Easter Parade is really good. Revolutionary Road is really good, too. And that is it for us. You can find notes for this and all our shows at Radio Free Book Club blog on medium.com, which will be updated soon. Please consider following us. Drop us a note on Facebook and stream the show wherever you listen to podcasts. We're always listening to what you have to say about the book and about the show. Our show is produced for 99.1 WQRTLP by the always awesome Oreo Jones. For Christine Hudson, Craig Von Dalen, Corey Michael Dalton, and all the members of Radio Free Book Club, I'm Ken Honeywell. Thanks for listening. And join us next month when we'll be reading Nathan Hill's follow-up to his popular 2016 novel, The Knicks, last year's novel, Wellness. Until then, read a book. Read a book.